Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. Mark, I'm really pleased to have you. Thank you for joining The No Show. Um, how have you been dealing with these past crazy few months? Um, working from home mostly. So we, along with all other universities, were kicked out of our labs and, and offices back in mid-March. So after a little bit of teaching online, um, basically working from the office at home, trying to support the people in my research group um, and in my department at the university so that they feel okay and are able to do some work but don't feel under pressure um, because, you know, how people can achieve things during this time period so depends upon where they live, what caring responsibilities they have, and all those associated things. So I think it's really important to give people the the, the space and the emotional support they need to be able mm -hmm. to do what they can and not to put pressure on people. But we were very lucky. The labs reopened in June, I think. And so my research group are back in the labs doing research, but I'm still stuck at home because our offices aren't open until September. So we meet on Zoom and we have WhatsApp calls and MS Teams calls, and that way we can stay in touch and I can support and give advice and you know stay on top of everything that's going on. But as with everybody, you know, it's it's tricky and it's something we've never had to do before. I have to say I'm enjoying not having the commute. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't blame you. Um, but I want to ask, how, how much has it inter um, interrupted or disrupted, rather, the progress of, of the research itself in the labs? Um, quite dramatically, really, because um, essentially we all had to drop everything in, in March. So if there were experiments that were ongoing or that you'd been preparing for to start, you know, and that preparation period can take anywhere from a couple of days to several months. Mm. All of that just had to stop. And that meant a huge loss of all of that time and investment. Um, and then when you get the labs restarted again, it takes time to get everything going again and everything rolling. So um, it's, be, it's been a, a huge disruption. Um, and I guess I see that particularly because I run this European wide project called, called Poshby. Um, and we have partners, we have 43 partners in Poshby and they're scattered in countries all over Europe. And of course, every country has had a different timeline and a different mm -hmm. set of restrictions. So our colleagues in Italy were hit first and hit really, really hard in terms of constraints. Whereas our colleagues in Sweden have basically been able to work through. So understanding and managing all that to make sure that large scale project still knits together. Um, and that we're supporting everybody within that is is challenging to say the least and so um tell me tell me a bit about the project well what's the sort of aims of the project so so poshby is a, a european horizon 2020 funded project which means that it, it is really aimed at um trying to solve a problem which the european union recognizes as having major societal impacts and that problem is really how do we maintain um, pollinator health, so the health of both individuals and populations of bees on the whole um, across Europe um, so that they can provide the pollination services to the crops that we rely on for food. Um, so obviously um, pollination is the transfer of pollen from one plant to um, another plant where it fertilizes and allows the plant to seed set. Um, and a large proportion of that in agricultural crops as well as in wildflowers and, and, and other plants relies upon pollinating insects to move from flower to flower um, and most of our understanding of that pollination activity is based on our understanding of what bees do um, and when I say bees um, I think everybody always thinks bees oh honeybees mm. um, but actually there are about 20,000 different species or kinds of bee across wow. the world um, 
in the UK, for example, we have about 250 species and the honeybee is only one of those and it's managed. It's largely a, a managed species looked after by beekeepers and all of the other bees are wild. Um, and so when we're talking about managing bee health and sustaining bee health to sustain the pollination services they provide from which we benefit, it's not just about keeping honeybees healthy, it's actually a lot more about how do we manage our landscapes um, mm -hmm. to support the health of wild bees? And, and has so it, what, how much of a problem has it been for them, for the EU to actually say, hold on, we need, we need to do something about it? So this, is, this has been, been building for a long time. So there have been a number of previous projects which have looked at pollinators um, in the European Union, um, going back probably about 10 years or so now. Um, and that's been driven by a lot of um, a lot of different um, routes, I guess. So there's been pressure from the citizens of of Europe to do something about it um, because they are are aware of the fact that pollinators are, are in decline. There's been pressure from scientists as well, and that's fed into policymakers in the EU and at national governments deciding that this is a priority and needs to be needs to be looked at and so you know if you look within the within the uk which is my home country we have a, a national pollinator initiative we have a lot of research going into how we understand declines in pollinators and how we change change those declines and reverse them and support populations and that's actually being done at a much a much broader scale across the eu being coordinated obviously by the european commission um, and the particular project that I'm leading, POSHB, is really focused on the impact of agrochemicals, so things like insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, on the health of bees, and also how those chemical products interact with other things that can stress wild bees or managed honeybees, so things like parasites, a lack of food, so poor nutrition, um, Interestingly, these are all things we worry about in human populations as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and actually, these, are, these, these problems more broadly are, are issues for all aspects of life. You know, how can we avoid contaminating the environment so much that, that, things, that the health of, of whatever we're looking at isn't impacted? How can we make sure everything has the nutritional requirements it needs? And how can we, particularly timely at the moment, whilst the human population is dealing with COVID, how can we manage parasites and, and pathogens to minimize the impact they have on populations? Mm -hmm. I, it seems like it's a very, um, very complex system to work with, uh, given that you know, there's all these different types of species and the fact that you know, you're dealing with the impact of various different things like um, you know, um, agrochemicals. So how much is it um, how much are you able to sort of control? How much are we able to control given that the system is so complex? So that's a really good question. Um, and I think the, the answer is, is that we, we choose a number of what in science we call model systems. Um, so we choose a subset of the different kinds of B to try to get an understanding of what the impacts are. And then from a, from the approach of trying to understand these different stresses, so agrochemicals, pathogens, nutrition, we start in the lab um, where we can control absolutely everything and we go all the way through to the real world where our ability to control is much less, but we can use those laboratory and semi-laboratory studies to help us understand the patterns that we see in natural systems or agricultural systems. Mm. So. For example, we're, we're not looking at, you know, 250 or 500 different species of bee. We're looking at three species of bee. One is the honeybee, because that's a very important species, even though it's largely managed. Two, we're looking at a species of bumblebee, um, because bumblebees are, like honeybees, they're social animals, but their, their sociality is very different to that of honeybees. Um, and they're very, very important pollinators in Europe. And then we're looking at one species of what we call a solitary bee because it doesn't live in family groups like honeybees do or like, like bumblebees do. 
um, each individual makes its own home and does its own thing. And so that's actually representative of the vast majority of the different kinds of bee mm. on the planet. And so there we've got three representatives of the different sort of social types of bee, if you like. Um, and then we can work with each of those in the laboratory. We can take individuals or colonies and expose them to say one chemical or combine that chemical with a nutritional stress or with a different parasite and understand what happens to the bee under those very controlled circumstances. But also we can go out into the real world and we can collect information about what kind of stresses do bees really face in the wild? What chemicals are they exposed to? What parasites and pathogens are they getting? How much of them are they getting? What kind of food limitations are they under? And then we can use the information from those two sets of, of, of studies. So those field observation studies where we're trying to just record what's happening mm -hmm. naturally and those very con controlled lab studies to then go and design experiments that we can conduct in the field, so out in the real world, and where we therefore hope to have a chance of understanding what's going on because we have all of this other information. And that's why it's such a large project because we have to knit all of those different yeah. pieces together. So some partners are looking in the lab, some partners are looking in the field, other partners are focused on chemical analysis, others are doing nutritional analysis, and we pull all of that together to hopefully at the end be able to go back to policymakers and risk assessors and say, these are the things you should be looking at. Here are some ideas and some tools that we can use to try to move us to a place where we're more sustainable in how we're using chemicals, for example, or in how we construct our landscapes to make sure that we can actually have sustainable bee populations that will do all this work for us mm -hmm. that we that we rely on for our nutrition. Uh, that, that's very interesting. And at what stage are you guys at at the moment? So we're we're just entering our third year. Um, so it's a five year long project. And as with all all five year projects, it has quite a big you know, it takes a while to get everything going. Mm -hmm. um, but in our, so we started um, three years ago in, in June, essentially. Um, and, and in our first full summer, which was last year, um, we conducted a huge exp experiment across Europe. So in eight different countries, so in Ireland, in the UK, in Spain, in Switzerland, Germany, Sweden, Estonia, and Italy, um, we went to two different crops, so apple orchards and oilseed rape crops, and we put out sentinel colonies of honeybees, bumblebees, and solitary bees, and then we collected a whole set of information. Um, and that's going to help us understand um, what those bees are exposed to in those situations. So we collect bees to see what kinds of chemicals they come back with, what kind of food they come back with, what kind of parasites they pick up. Um, and we also measure the health of those colonies and bees that we put out into those sites. And that will give us some idea, will give us a, a very good idea about exposure across Europe in all these different countries um, to agrochemicals, to parasites and pathogens and to nutritional stress. And it will give us some idea about how those might be impacting the health of bees. And so at the moment, we're analysing all of those samples. Um, and that's going to take a long time because we have thousands and thousands and thousands of samples to analyse. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people would have been in the lab from March yeah. until now analysing those data. And of course, because of COVID, we're, we're a bit behind, but we're, we're working to catch up. So how do you track the bees once you sort of put them out in these um, different environments? Well, the nice thing about bees is that they come home. Um, mm. So um, when a bee goes out to forage, um, if it's a honeybee, it just comes back to its hive. If it's a bumblebee, it comes back to its nest. And because we put those out, we know where they are. Mm. Um, and if it's a solitary bee, what it will do is come back to a nest site and then construct its own nest within that. And so when we put out the solitary bees, we also put out um, 
traps, which are basically a series of hollow tubes. And you can make these with things like bamboo or cardboard or whatever you like. Um, and if you make them the right width, then they're very attractive to a particular species of solitary bee. And so when those solitary bees colonize those, those traps we put out, we can then use those to record what those bees are bringing back as well. So we don't have to go around the fields following an individual bee, although that's actually quite fun to do. Yeah. Um, but at the scale of the data we want, it's just not feasible. Um, and so we're relying on the bees to bring stuff back home. And then we can, we can um, check those bees, but also check what they bring back. So if they bring back a load of pollen on their legs, we may have a sample of that. For honeybees, we have samples of the honey that they've made, for example. Um, mm. And so tell me a bit, uh, because obviously bees have, you know, historically been uh, something of a fascination for human beings, uh, looking at sort of the behavior of bees in, in, within like a hive and, and, you know, the queen bee and all that sort of stuff. What's their, how have they, you know, from, from your perspective, how have they been interacting with parasites? Um, so that's a, that's a really interesting question. And actually the whole, the whole um, sort of perspective of human interactions with bees is really interesting too. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously humans um, have interacted with honeybees um, for thousands of years. Um, and we have, you know, pretty good evidence of that from ancient Egypt, um, from ancient China, um, through to the present day. Um, but if we move outside of, you know, that's, that's perhaps what many of us normally think of. But if we step outside of that and we move to Central America and South America, um, people there have interacted with a, another group of bees called stingless bees for, again, hundreds to thousands of years. Um, so stingless bees are, also live in, in family groups, quite big family groups. But as the name suggests, they have no sting. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're perhaps a little bit easier to look after than, than honeybees are. And so stingless bees have also been managed for, for hundreds of years by, by humans too. Um, and there are even, you know, in the last 20, 30 years, humans have started managing bumblebees. So domesticated bumblebees are a major industry in Europe and they're used for basically every tomato you eat unless you grew it in your own back garden. That's been pollinated by a, a bumblebee that was reared in a factory and then sent out with its family in a box to pollinate those crops. Oh, wow. Um, and most people have no idea about that. We generally think about things like bumblebees and we go, oh, you know, we go out on a summer day and you see them bumbling around flowers, but actually they're a big industry. Um, and there are also solitary bees um, which are increasingly managed for also for pollination. So in North America, they have the alfalfa leaf cutting bee which is used for pollinating alfalfa, which is a, a really big crop in, the, in North America. But actually that bee is European and it was brought over to do it. Um, and in Europe, we're increasingly using a, a solitary bee known as the red mason bee, um, Osmia bicornis, which is actually much better at pollinating apples, for example, than either honeybees or bumblebees are. Um, so different flowers really have evolved to be pollinated by different species of bee. Um, but in terms, in terms of their interactions with parasites, which is, sorry, which was your main question, um, in honeybees, it's a, it's a really interesting story. So obviously people have kept honeybees for hundreds, if not thousands of years, but it's really only in the last couple of hundred years that we've been able to keep them in a sustainable way. So it used to be that people would put out a container, perhaps, that honeybees would colonize, or they would go into the forest and find a, 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 a tree branch in which honeybees nested and cut those down. And then they would keep them for the year and then they would just destroy the colony to harvest the honey at the end of it. Mm -hmm. And it was only in the, it's really only in the last couple of hundred years um, that we've been able to really manage those honeybee hives so that we can harvest the honey without killing the bees. Um, and so it's really only in the last, last, couple of hundred years we've been able to really look at their interactions with with parasites um, and obviously everything has parasites I mean, you and I both have mites crawling around in our facial hair at the moment um, mm -hmm. and they they are ectoparasites of us so you know everything has parasites all the time and, and unsurprisingly honeybees bumblebees and other solitary bees 
and stingless bees all have parasites too. And most of those, most of those parasites have co-evolved with their hosts, so the hosts can defend themselves against them. Um, the parasites take advantage of them. The parasites cause different levels of damage, but it's all part of a, you know, it's part of a natural co-evolved system. What we see, and I think again, you know, COVID gives us a nice example of this, is when we disrupt those natural systems, that when, that's when things can go wrong. Um, and so with COVID, for example, what we see is the emergence of a new virus into the human population, to which the human population has no real defenses and which has spread globally around the world as, as a result. And that's why we're all being really impacted right now. And we've seen the same thing before. We saw it with SARS, with MERS. Um, the human population saw it with the bubonic plague and, and the Black Death in, in Europe and across Asia, um, not just in the 13, 14, 1500s, 1600s, but also more recently, um, there have been similar pandemics. And it, again, it's about diseases getting into populations which aren't able to, to deal with them. And we've seen that same thing with honeybees. So the European honeybee, which is now global because humans have taken it everywhere, um, picked up a, a parasitic mite from its cousin, the Asian honeybee, um, back in the, in the 1900s. And that mite spread due to human beekeeping activities around the globe. Um, and it has been absolutely devastating for managed honeybees because those European honeybees have no natural defenses against it. They haven't mm -hmm. evolved with it for millions or thousands of years. It suddenly appeared in their population. If we left it alone, then over time, it's quite likely that the European honeybee would evolve to deal with it. But because we manage it, um, we're not allowing that to happen. And so what we see is that if we don't manage that mite, it's devastating to honeybee hives. To manage it, we have to chemically treat those hives to kill the mite. Um, and so it leaves honeybee keepers with a really hard job about balancing that, you know, how do you keep the mite population low enough to keep your honeybees healthy enough? Um, and that's a, very, that's a very tricky thing. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, those mites, um, they're called Varroa destructor, which is quite, a, <laughs> quite an emotive name. Um, the mites are bad themselves, but actually perhaps almost worse are the viruses that they transmit. So these are viruses that were, were native to the honeybee in the first place, but the mite has given them a new route of transmission. And those viruses have exploded as a result. And so the honeybees, the managed honeybees, don't have to just cope with this new mite, but they have to cope with an explosion of viruses that normally they can control. But now these viruses have a whole new route of transmission and suddenly the honeybee is having real problems with them. Um, so that sort of managed honeybees. Mm -hmm. um, in, wild, in wild bees, we, we have much less of an idea of what's going on. We know from, from work that was being done and one of the, one of the earliest and, and, and one of the strongest studies actually came out of my own research group and it was work done by a postdoctoral fellow, Matthias Furst, who's now based in Vienna in Austria. And what Matthias's work showed was that there's really strong evidence that these viruses that are being transmitted in honeybees by this mite are spilling over into wild bee populations. Mm. Um, and so that's just analogous to that spillover of COVID from whatever wild species it came from, whether it was bats or whether it was, was um, pangolins or whatever, into the human population. And when you get that spillover, then you're suddenly making those wild bees deal with a whole new problem, which again, they haven't had thousands of years of evolution to deal with. Um, and we don't understand really at the moment whether the, that spillover of, of parasites and pathogens is a real problem for wild bees um, or whether it's just something which is fairly negligible for them. Um, and that's one thing that we're trying to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's variable evidence there. Some studies suggest it, it could be a real issue. Other studies suggest that perhaps it isn't. Um, and figuring that, that out is very difficult. And obviously there's no alternative. I mean, so supposing there is, God forbid, but supposing there is a, you know, like uh, some kind of outbreak of a disease that, you know, kills off a large population of bees or wild bees. How devastating would that be to just 
a human sustainability in general? Um, in in that kind of scenario, um, it would it would be really serious because a lot of our crops rely on wild pollinators. It really varies from crop to crop and place to place where they're being grown, but it can vary from 100% of the pollination being done by wild pollinators down to zero. Some estimates suggest that on average it's about 50%, but it's, it's just very variable from crop to crop and place to place. Mm -hmm. So it could have a really big impact and that impact would be variable depending upon what crop and where we were where we were talking about. Um, I think that that kind of scenario from from parasites and, and disease is less likely though than it happening just through the way humans change the landscape because as we intensify our use of the landscape we remove not just the resources that wild bees rely upon for food but we also remove the places where they live and the places where they can hibernate over winter um, and that's historically historically those changes have been the major drivers of wild bee decline um, we believe um, so urbanization has had a small contribution but is increasing has in, is, is having an increasing threat as urban areas grow bigger um, and the intensification of agriculture that happened from sort of the 18 50s onwards in Western Europe and at different times in other places around the world, that intensification of agriculture has had a huge impact on all biodiversity. Um, and from the beat, from the perspective of pollinators, it's removed a lot of the resources, a lot of the flowers that they rely on, a lot of the places they like to make nests, and a lot of the places they spend the winter. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we need to, to be managing and, and figuring out how to manage if we want to maintain sustainable populations of these animals. Mm -hmm. And so you've talked about the sort of the role of urbanization and how using the land is affecting sort of the bees and, and them having, a, you know, like, you know, a place to live and, you know, just a, a normal sustainable environment. But then what role does you know the the, the agrochemical industry have in sort of hindering the evolution of these bees um so i think there's the so you have to sort of start with the with the broad context there and so what we have at the moment um certainly across europe north america large areas of south america um, China and other other huge regions across Asia um, and in, in parts of Af Africa is intensive agriculture that relies upon huge inputs to work. Mm -hmm. So we input, you know, a lot of fertilizers to maintain nitrogen levels in, and the levels of other minerals that crops need. Um, we apply herbicides to kill weeds so to reduce competition for our crops we apply fungicides to control fungal pests of those crops and we apply insecticides to kill insect pests of those crops and that intensive form of agriculture has has sort of grown up with the increasing use of these agrochemicals um, unfortunately those agrochemicals have have side effects that are that are not positive and from the perspective of pollinators, um, I and many other scientists, as well as many policymakers, believe there's very strong evidence that at least some of those agrochemicals have ne negative impacts on pollinators. So a particular group um, which got a lot of press in Europe over the last 10 years is a group called neonicotinoids. And they're called that, called that because their chemical structure is very similar to nicotine. So the stuff that people who smoke um, get in their cigarettes. And as we know, that's, that's an addictive substance. What it does is it binds to neurons in the brain. Neonicotinoids do the same thing with insects. They bind to neurons in the brain and at the right level, um, they will kill those insects because they essentially um, paralyze them. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the, it turns out that at lower levels, um, so levels where you don't see any obvious mortality or death of the animal 
they also still have a significant impact on the animals. And that's understandable because they're binding to receptors in the brain. And it turns out they change their behavior. They affect their ability to learn and remember things. And in bees, that seems to have knock-on effects for the health of the population as a whole. Um, and so there have been a, a number of studies, some correlational um, and some full-scale field experiments across multiple countries which show significant negative impacts of those neonicotinoids on, on the health of bees. And that's what led um, largely to the banning of those chemicals in outside use or a subset of those chemicals in outside use in Europe. They're still very widely used across the rest of the world. Um, but there are thousands of different kinds of agrochemicals. Mm -hmm. um, and we have almost no understanding of, of, of the sublethal effects of any of those in, in, in the vast majority of animals. Um, and I guess the, the, the part of the, the work that we're trying to do, and of course uh, many other scientists around the world is trying to, are trying to do, is to understand um, what are the costs and benefits of using agrochemicals in the way we currently do. So obviously there are a lot of benefits in terms of enhanced food security, but are the costs that they're imposing um, too high or are they uns unsustainable costs? Um, and so what our work is trying to do, um, along with many others, is trying to figure out how do we get this balance right? Um, mm -hmm. can, we, can we reduce the amount of agrochemicals to a level where they don't have negative impacts on the beneficial insects that we need while still doing, their, doing the job that they're for, there for um, in terms of controlling insect pests? Can we manage farming in a, in a perhaps a, a slightly less intense but more sustainable way while still producing the food yield we need? Mm -hmm. um, and these are really, really huge, complex questions, and they 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 can't be answered in a in a five year project for sure. Um, but there are hundreds and possibly thousands of scientists around the world trying to figure out the answers to these questions. Because you know, as we go forward, I certainly hope that we that we that we have a world where we sustain our biodiversity, um, where we have sustainable systems. Um, where, of course, we can produce the food that we need to make sure that people aren't hungry, whilst at the same time making sure that we sustain the biodiversity that we need, not just for the production of those crops, but because we should have a planet of biodiversity. I, I personally believe that we have a moral and ethical um, requirement to not destroy wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously those, those two things, managing human food needs, um, and managing biodiversity are often in conflict. And so it's, it's about finding that, that happy point where we are sustaining biodiversity as much as we possibly can, whilst at the same time providing the food that people need to eat. Mm -hmm. And as somebody that, that has been researching sort of aspects of biodiversity and bees, um, do you think enough, is, enough research is being done on the impact of these agrochemicals on on bees or on other insects for that matter. Well, I, ha I have to say no, otherwise I'd be invalidating my entire my entire research project. Um, but I think the answer the answer fundamentally is no. Um, I think I think the answer is also there will never be enough research. What we have to figure out is how much we need to make the hard decisions about what we're doing. Um, so there could always be another research project. There are always new agrochemicals being produced. Um, what we have to do is, is to do the, the key bits of research that allow policymakers to make the decisions about what kind of world we live in. Mm -hmm. Because those decisions are not, those decisions, are not decisions for, for scientists to make for the rest of the world. Our job is to, is to find out what's happening um, and certainly if we have an individual viewpoint, then it's our, our right as individuals to push that. So some scientists push very strongly for a, a, a chemical-free agriculture. Um, other scientists push very strongly for the correct use of smart chemicals to manage agriculture. Um, it's not our job to make those decisions. Our job is to provide the evidence 
that enables the public mm -hmm. and also policymakers to make the appropriate decisions or what they think are the appropriate decisions at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are some key questions we can answer. So, you know, are, is a particular chemical more damaging than other chemicals? Can we use it in ways that reduces the risk to wild pollinators? Um, can we change the landscape, the way we structure it and use it, to make sure that there is food for pollinators throughout the year, um, as opposed to a big glut of food when a crop flowers and then nothing mm -hmm. for the next six months? Um, and those are things that, as scientists, we can do. And then we can provide that information and say, look, if you manage the landscape in this way, if you manage the use of agrochemicals in this way, you will have a better, healthier population of pollinators. If you do it in this way, you will have less. Mm -hmm. And then it's, and then their job is to actually make those decisions. Um, just like at the moment, it's not the scientists who are making the decisions about the lockdowns that we put in place for COVID. It's the politicians. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's really interesting sort of a, a perspective because ultimately is, I mean, ultimately the job of the scientists is to shed light. And I want to ask you, how did you um, sort of, what, what attracted you into sort of research into bees and, and that sort of stuff? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's another very good question. It's quite a, quite a long and convoluted pathway, um, I guess. Um, if we really go back, when I was, like many, like many biologists, when I was a child, I was really interested in, in the outside world. Mm -hmm. um, I liked watching butterflies and birds. I was focused on, on animals more than on plants, I have to admit. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked counting things. So in my, in my summer holidays, I would find a, a buddleia that was flowering, for example, and I would sit there for days recording how many different kinds of butterflies came to it. And oh, wow. I, I find that kind of thing very satisfying. It's, it's interesting to see who's, who's coming and why are they coming to this plant and not to that plant and how many of them are there and is that different when the weather is different and you know all these sorts of things you can do as a small child. You don't need anything but your eyes and a notepad. Um, I, I really enjoyed and so I sort of knew I wanted to be a scientist. Um, I, read a, I read a science fiction book when I was about 12 called The Trouble with Lichen by a guy called John Wyndham. Mm -hmm. um, and it had its main character was a, a female biochemist who discovered a chemical in, in lichen that extended the human lifespan. Um, and I read that and I just thought, I want to be a biochemist. That sounds amazing. Um, and then I realized that biochemistry was mostly, mostly chemistry mm -hmm. and very little biology. Mm -hmm. um, and so I backed off a little bit and I was like, okay, I want to do zoology. And I, I was lucky enough to, do, to go to university and to do a degree in zoology. And at the time, I really wanted to work with birds. Um, I did my undergraduate research project on birds. Um, but one of my, one of my tutors um, worked on ants. She worked on seed-eating ants in the Arizona desert in the US. Um, and she asked me if I'd like to come and be a field assistant for her one summer. Um, and... I came, I, I, came I, I guess I came from a background where the idea of, you know, being able to travel to the US was like, how could anyone do that? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had this opportunity and I thought, I've got to go because I'll never, ever get to go there again. <laughs> um, I didn't know anything about ants. I wasn't particularly interested in insects. Um, I admired this, this lecturer hugely, <clears throat> but I didn't really know what she did. So I flew out to the States and um, spent six weeks in the Arizona desert getting up at four in the morning. Um, watching and counting ants and recording what they did um, between about 5.30 and 11.30, at which point it got so hot you couldn't think anymore. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and then going back in the afternoon to the field station and writing down everything we recorded. Um, and I absolutely fell in love with the ants, which I know sounds strange, but they're very beautiful and they're so interesting. And also just fell in love with research. And it's like, this is what I want to do. Um, finding out things that nobody knows um it's just it's what a what a wonderful opportunity to have really mm -hmm. um so i went and did a phd on ants with with deborah um who was the lecturer who asked me out to go to out and study these ants did my phd with her in california um came back to the uk didn't have a job 
Um, and so was applying for everything, um, not getting asked to any interviews. I'd almost given up and was applying to join the civil service instead, which seemed like a, a backup plan. Hmm. When I got asked to Switzerland to interview for a, a position there, which was working with bumblebees. Um, and I was very lucky I was offered that position and that's how I started working with bees. Okay. So, so it's really like a sort of, I, I guess it's kind of like a, a very lucky sort of opening. Yeah, absolutely. I was, I was incredibly lucky. I think many times I was, I was lucky to have, I was lucky to have a garden um, that I could, Mm -hmm. sit in as a child and to live on the edge of a very small town so we could go running around in the fields a lot i was i was lucky that we were um that i got in, you know that i was able to go to university mm -hmm. and then i was incredibly lucky to have the opportunity to go to to america and then again very lucky and i think lots of people who who go through these go through scientific pathways there are a lot of people who who have who are excellent and just don't get the lucky breaks i guess like in every every field of work yeah um we all rely on luck to some degree Absolutely. in our careers um so i've been i've been very fortunate i've also worked incredibly hard but that doesn't necessarily get you mm. get you success so it's, it's always a combination of of hard work and and luck and you know trying to to build build what you want to do um, Absolutely, and and ultimately, it ha I mean, it has paid off in the fact that you currently sort of run the Brown Lab at, at Royal Holloway, and you're part of this fantastically important research. Thank you. Yeah. No, I'm I'm I I, I do recognise how how fortunate I am to have have my own research group um, and to be at such a great university, um, and also to be able to to work with actually so many talented colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, across Europe, trying to trying to answer these questions. So, it's on the, on the days when when you work ridiculous hours and everything goes wrong. It's always good to be able to to sit back and go. Actually, you know, I'm in, I'm incredibly lucky. I'm doing a job that I love, and I'm doing work which I hope will, you know, change how we how we do things in the world in a way that will be good not just for bees but for humans as well absolutely absolutely so. and, and that's a, a fantastic thing to to want to achieve i, I want to just briefly just kind of t tell me a bit about the sort of ant research that you did um so so i guess the the research that my group is doing at the moment and has been doing for the last 10 years or so um really sits at the crossover between conservation and pure science. So mm -hmm. originally with, when I started working with bumblebees, I was, I was looking at their interactions with parasites. And the only reason I was doing that work was because it was, it was academically really interesting. You know, understanding how hosts and parasites interact with each other is a really important scientific question. Um, but there was no idea that it would have any applied value at the time. Um, and then, um, I moved from Switzerland and actually was lucky enough to have my first job in Dublin in Ireland. Um, and that's when I started getting into the more conservation side of, of bee work. Um, and in the UK and my lab in the UK has been going for over 10 years now, we've really tried to merge all of those aspects. And so we look at how parasites are spread from one bee to another or from one colony to another. We look at the impact that those parasites have on the health of the bees and how the bees defend themselves against it. We've done some really um, work that I'm really excited about, which is a collaboration with colleagues at the Royal Botanic Gardens of Kew. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we're looking at how the chemicals that plants put into nectar and pollen actually might be being used by bees to protect themselves against parasites okay. and that's been that's been really exciting work um, in in my lab um, it's been done largely by a phd student called aaron folly and my collaborator at q um, a professor there called phil stevenson um, he has a, a postdoc called hauke who's hauke cock who's been working on this and we have this sort of big project together and we're not the only people doing this in the world. There's a, there are some fantastic groups in the States as well, but we found some really, really interesting stuff out, which I hope will be, be useful going forwards in terms of protecting bee health. Um, but also just understanding how bees use flowers, not just for food, but also, you know, to, 
to treat themselves for diseases is is really cool. Who would have thought? That's amazing. That I mean, that's mind blowing. There, that's that's yeah. really mind blowing. It's really, it's really, it's it's it's, it's exciting stuff. I I really like it. Um, but we've also obviously been doing a lot of work looking at how agrochemicals impact bee health. Um, and what we're doing now is really putting those two things together. So, you know, if you have bees in the lab that are exposed to a parasite and also exposed to an agrochemical, is the impact what you would expect from those two things individually? So is it just an additive effect? Or actually, do you see impacts that you wouldn't expect from just looking at them individually? Mm -hmm. um, and so that work is... is yeah, we, we just don't know what we're going to see. It's, it's really at the cutting edge of, of knowledge. And we're also doing work trying to develop new protocols for assessing the impact of agrochemicals. So at the moment, the protocols, that the methods that we use for doing that are fairly limited. And so we're trying to develop new methods that have a, a, more, a more subtle and more nuanced to get a better idea of what's, what's going on there. Um, and all of that obviously feeds into bee conservation because if we can protect those bees, then that means we can support their, their populations in the wild. So a lot of that work we do with, with bees in the lab, and very occasionally we get to go out into the field, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much of the, the research that you are doing now, how much of it was sort of informed by the research that you did in your PhD on ants? Um, so I guess in one sense, you could say none of it. Um, so I guess the, the big things that come across is that in my PhD, I learned how to do science. I learned how to design experiments, how to think scientifically about questions, how to analyze data, how to interpret results, and then how to package that in, in a story that helps people understand what it means. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess if, if you, you really sort of look at the underpinnings, the work that I did in my PhD on ants was all about interactions. So it was how do individual ants interact with each other and how does that change their behavior? How do colonies interact with each other and how does that change behavior at the colony level? And when you're talking about host parasite systems, you're talking about an interaction there as well, the interaction between the host and parasite itself. And so the sort of broader understanding I got about interactions and how they can work does feed into the work that I do and that my group does looking at how bumblebees and their parasites interact with each other. Mm -hmm. so I guess there's sort of the broader scientific enterprise and then the, then the very specific. Um, but I have to say, if you'd asked me when I was an undergraduate, um, when I was, you know, 21, whether I would be working on the impacts of agrochemicals on bee health, um, you know, 25 years later, I would have not known what you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I can so. imagine. I mean, I mean, I don't think anybody sort of anybody's life works in that sort of linear fashion. No, no, I agree. And I think I think one of the things in 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 science, and and I think particularly when when we're trying to encourage people to come into science and to sort of, and, and I guess particularly at the moment, there's, there's an enormous discussion about how we can do that in a way to enhance diversity in science and to really support um, groups who have previously not taken part in science as much as you would hope or expect. And so obviously I'm talking I'm particularly about um, BAME, so people of color, black, ethnic minority groups, but also women and people with disabilities um, you know how do we bring that diversity into science and i think one of the problems we have with that one of the one of one of the many problems we have with that is that very often people look at scientists and they think you know you had this linear plan for your life you always knew what you were going to do and i think it's really powerful to to go into a, a school and and talk to school kids and just explain how you got to where you are so that they, end, they can see actually, you know, life is not this linear planned thing. Mm -hmm. There are accidents and lucky breaks and things that didn't go right and other things that did. Um, and understanding that narrative, that story of how people got to where they are, I think is, is a really powerful um, way of connecting with people, but also making them see that it's possible to, to go into science. Um, so I'm, when I was, trying to go into science 
you know, so when I was 18 to 21, um, I lived in a country where it was actually illegal um, for me to be me. So as a gay man, back in the 1980s, 1990s in the UK, it was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see anybody in science who was, who was gay or lesbian. Um, and so for me at the time, I had to make the decision, do I want to go into science where I don't see anybody like me? I don't see anybody giving me a role model of how I can be me in science. Mm -hmm. Or do I go in and assume that I have to hide everything for the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. um, and obviously I've been very lucky because of the way society has changed. But that was a lot easier for me because I could hide who I was. But if you are a woman or if your skin happens to be a different colour yeah. to the majority of people, or if you're in a wheelchair or if you have visual um, or hearing difficulties, you can't hide what you are to integrate yourself. And so you need role models, but you also need a very welcoming environment to be able to take full advantage of it. And I think it's Absolutely. really important that scientists tell their stories to, 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 to help people do that. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because um, we've been, I mean, part of the sort of the most important thing in this, in this whole sort of setup of the podcast was for us to sort of get young people involved into research who are from BAME and who are from sort of um underrepresented um demographics or, or groups um in academia because one of the things i realized doing all the research that i do with academics around the country around the world is that there is such an incredible underrepresentation of, of different groups and i'm really glad you brought that up because part of the sort of wanting to do something is having role models and having people like you that you can relate to doing it and so we've um, we've been fortunate enough to you know have this podcast. We've had over you know like uh, sixty interviews so far, and we've recently started you know the No Show community where we really do want to get young people involved in research. And and but when, when I say involved in research, it's not like sort of force feeding them research. It's really just showing them actually. Did you know that you can study? the the impact of bees and and what bee what sort of um agrochemicals what impact they have on bees and how that affects your life and the sustainability of our food sources and that sort of stuff so i'm really glad you brought that up and i think it's it's really important for us to sort of shed light on the fact that there is underrepresentation and we do need to you know speak with them get people like yourself in front of them and and, and actually having a dialogue with them where where possible Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and I think, you know, now is a moment where, where certainly in science, lots of scientists are, are thinking about this and trying to figure out how we can, how we can change what we do to, to make those interactions more frequent and more effective. Um, and just communicating, I think, you know, it's very hard for people who don't do the work that you do to understand what you do and that's true that's true obviously in in any field mm -hmm. but i think we perhaps have more of a you know if if you said to somebody what does a lawyer do they they could give you a, a fair idea of what they think a lawyer does but if you said to someone what does uh, an ecotoxicologist do they would probably look at you blankly mm -hmm. um or be able if best to give a very small description and i think very often as scientists you know we do work in these very small niches of knowledge and we sometimes forget that you know that's not the everyday life of everyone we're talking to mm -hmm. um so you could talk about the research you do in a way which is really accurate but not very helpful or communicative or you can make it engaging and fun um so in the poshby project for example we're producing a whole series of just very little video clips you know maybe half a minute to a minute and a half just showing what people are doing on their day-to-day -day life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's stuff that we don't think is very interesting or exciting because we do it all the time. But you show it to somebody else and they go, oh, I didn't know that that was a thing exactly. or that that existed. And then they have a world in which it's opened up and they cannot ask questions. So I, th I think that kind of communication is, is hugely important. I used to, when I was a, a PhD student in California, I used to go into primary schools. Um, so 
I was I was I was lucky enough to do my PhD at Stanford University, which mm -hmm. is very wealthy, and right next door to Palo Alto, which is the heart of Silicon Valley and very wealthy. And the city right next door to Palo Alto is a city called East Palo Alto. And the year that I moved to America in 1992, it had the highest murder rate per capita in the USA. Wow. Um, there was a huge division between Palo Alto and East Palo Alto. Palo Alto was largely um, Asian American and white American, and East Palo Alto was largely African American. Um, there was a huge disparity in schools, in all sorts of stuff. And so I used to go over in, a, in, a, in this fantastic program, which recruited graduate students from Stanford, and we could go over and we could help to teach a science lesson in the school. And it was one of the most uplifting things I've ever done because you actually got to, to share stuff that these kids would never otherwise experience um, and just you know, open their eyes to stuff that otherwise they wouldn't otherwise see. Um, we got to take them out to our field study sites where they'd never otherwise be able to go because it's a private university reserve. We got to take them to Stanford campus, which even though it was only a few miles from where they lived, they'd never been to because it was this big white exclusionary thing. Mm. And it was just amazing. It was fantastic. And we, we did something very similar at Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. And of course, UK universities do outreach like this all around, all around the UK. Um, and I, I, I just think that kind of outreach is, is hugely, hugely important because not everybody is lucky enough to come from a background which meshes with you know, the predominant university culture. Mm -hmm. And we should be changing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Where can people find you online to, if they want to have, have any queries or just want to follow your work? Um, so I've got a, I've got a website. Um, so um, it's markjsbrown.com. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll link I, you onto the video anyway. So they cool. can click on it. Excellent. Um, I also have a university website as well, which is a bit more formal than my, than my lab website. Um, I'm on Twitter. So yeah. I've got a Twitter handle, which is at Sferilaria. Um, you'll, you, you can find that on my, on my email address. I'll, I'll, I'll link it all on, on, onto the video cool. so people can get direct access uh, to it. So, and all of, all of those places are, are good to either follow what we're doing, um, you know, and obviously if people want to drop me, drop me questions, they're more than welcome to. Um, I'll get to them as quickly as I can. Um, but, but yeah, um, all of that works. Excellent. And, and just finally, what bit of advice would you give to a student who might hear this and, and want to get into this line of research? Um, so what kind of student are we talking about? A, a high school student? Yeah, a high school student, college, like going and getting, looking to go into university. Yeah. So I'd say for anyone who's, who's looking to, to go to university, decide what you really enjoy. Because studying what you really enjoy you will do so much better than if you do something because you think you should do it. Absolutely. Um, so if you're excited about something, if something really enthuses you, go down that route because um, you never know where it's going to lead you, but you're going to really enjoy it. Um, and if you, want to get, if you want to get into research, then um, look at universities that are research active where it's very clear that in your, in your degree, you'll get to interact directly with researchers and do, a, mm -hmm. do an active you know, lab or field-based research project where you'll be working with animals or plants or fungi or, or chemicals or whatever, where you're doing it yourself, because that's the only way to see actually whether research is really what you want to do. A lot of people think they want to be a researcher and then they do their final year research project and they go, actually, this isn't for me at all. Because a lot of it's really boring, honestly. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of it is measuring the same thing again and again and again and again and that can be really tedious and you have to have the right kind of you know mentality to to be able to cope with that and enjoy it actually um and recognize that it's part of the whole process um and yeah those that's what i would recommend and always talk to if you're applying to university and you're interested in research bring that up talk to the the academics there about it and just say you know I want to get involved in research in my university. Will I be able to do that if I come to you? How would I do it? Um, who can I talk to? Be proactive. The more proactive you are, the more opportunities you have. I wish that I had been so much more proactive at undergraduate than I was. Um, I, I sort of tried to learn as much as I could and I, I, was, I responded really well. But you know, I didn't go to, to members of staff and say, 
I'd like to volunteer in your research group. Can I just get some experience? And I mm-hmm. really wish I'd done that. Um, so all those kinds of things, I think, are, are hugely important to figure out if it's what you want to do and to find out which route you want to go down. And I think the other thing is, um, you know, you you might think you want to do a particular kind of research right now, and you may find that changes, and that's yeah. okay. I thought I wanted to work on birds um, and I've ended up through ants working on bees um, and I love it. It's great. So yeah, be, be uh, open-minded. I think that's fantastic advice and, and it's, it's spot on. It's very, it's very timely as well, given that, you know, things are so extremely uncertain for, for young people. So um, I appreciate, I appreciate you taking the time to join us and, and I hope to have you on sometime soon. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Really nice to chat with you. Cheers, Mark. Thanks a lot. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.